Good afternoon. Okay, so last time I, I tried to start out by going over file I.O. and I got sidetracked, well not really sidetracked, but I, I wanted to make sure memory management was properly understood so that we don't leak memory unintentionally. Okay, that's one of the big things about C++ is that you're allowed to do things that you probably shouldn't do or you wouldn't want to normally do if you knew you were doing them, but the compiler doesn't always tell you you're doing them. Okay, so today we're going to start out with just a brief, um, for some of you might be review on how to do a separate file compilation. And then there's an error that many of you were receiving when you tried to do this on your own, which is you need the inline keyword. So we'll go over that first. And then if we have time, I'm hoping to, to start file IO today as well. So what ends up happening is, and what happened I'm sure in a lot of your homework files, is that the main.cpp or source.cpp um, gets really cluttered. You have all this stuff at the top, uh, all these class, classes at the top. You've got a bunch of stuff at the bottom beneath main where you've got all these uh, uh, definitions. All of your functions are defined down here. And it can be a real pain to try and find what you're looking for quickly. Okay? So the most common solution to this is creating a header and CPP file. So I've done it already for fraction. And what I've done is I've taken my fraction class and I've put the code before main in what's called a header file, a fraction.h file. So this is just the code uh, before main. There's my fraction declaration. Here are my non-member declarations. And then in fraction.cpp, the first thing I do is just include fraction.h at the top. And that's all I really need to do for um, and what that does is when this code goes to compile, when it tries to compile fraction.cpp, it will be aware of all of the code in fraction.h before it starts to logically figure out what, what goes where. Okay? So you have to have this include fraction.h. And then if you want to use the fraction class in main, along with your number include string, number include vector, you include a call to number include fraction.h. That then unlocks all of the code that was before this uh, point in time above main. So when you separate it off into a .h file, into a .cpp file, the .h file is like just literally you copy and paste the code that was before main into the header file. All the code that was not in main, you put in the, um, or below main, you put that in the uh, source file, the .cpp file. If you try and define a function in the header file, for example, if you try and define operator plus, as was suggested by the, um, the, the Stack Overflow article I posted on CCLE, really what it suggests is that you do a return LHS plus equals RHS. You put it all in one line. This shouldn't compile because I've already defined operator plus somewhere else. Already has a body. OK, there it is. Let me get rid of this and see what happens, see if I can recreate the error. OK, so oh, that's weird. OK, um, many of you were getting an error when you wrote it like this. You need the inline keyword. Let's see if that's the same error. Yeah, OK, so that's how you get the error to go away is you make it what's called inline. Making a function inline, let me, let me actually define this up above for you. It's in your book. I forget where in your book this is. But in, uh, if I go to source.cpp, I want to keep track of these topics. So separate file compilation, keyword inline. So inline is, a, I guess, a keyword that modifies a function. Or it's, a, it's a function. It's a, uh, that describes a function. So what is it? Basically, uh, inline suggests, this is very important, it suggests to the compiler that the function is short 
and therefore should just literally be substituted each time it sees a function call. Okay? So what actually happens is um, when you call a function, remember the stack and the heap and there's the stack variables? When you call a function, it adds a lot of baggage. It has to know when the function is done calling, what instead of instructions to return to, it has to include any parameters to the function, any return type, turn values from the function. So it, every time you call a function, you get a lot of extra baggage. By making a function inline, you suggest to the compiler that rather than create the infrastructure for a function, instead it's kind of like you tell the compiler, it's probably a better idea to just copy and paste this code here directly into the code itself. I don't want to write it like that myself because I want the code to look have a certain look, but the inline suggests that you might get either a speed enhancement or a memory enhancement by just substituting in the code verbatim. Okay? It is a suggestion because it's not guaranteed to do it, but um, and even if you don't put inline in front of a function, it may still inline it for you automatically. Okay? So um, inline really is just a suggestion. It is not a demand. If you try and inline a function, which is say 100 lines long, and you call it 50 times, the compiler may look at that and say, well, wait a minute, I would have to substitute this code in all this many times. It might make the executable file a bit larger, and it might opt not to inline it. Okay? So inlining is a suggestion to the compiler. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I did that for the fraction.h. And the reason why you inline a function is because it's really simple to state and write. It's either one or three lines of one to three lines of code. You know, maybe less than ten lines of code is, is a good candidate for inlining. The only reason I don't, I'm not a big fan of inlining right away. Why do you think I may not be a huge fan of inlining? Readability, how? Sort of. I mean, reading one line of code, that's actually fine. That's actually pretty nice, right? It's pretty elegant. I could even do that in the .cpp file, just put it on one line. It's kind of slick, right? But what does every function definition need? Comments. Hey, very good. Yeah, comments. Okay, so. Every function definition needs comments. Backslash star star. Description at param. At param. At return. What is the really, you know, look at this header file. How, how easy to read and, and, and look at is this header file? It's actually quite nice, right? I mean, if I want to know which constructors have I defined, they're right there. One, two, three. Uh, which operators have I defined? They're all listed right there. I can kind of figure, I mean, I can figure out what they do later on if I need to know the details. But for now, if I see a fraction class and I see operator plus equals has been implemented, that's a pretty good bet that I've implemented a, you know, addition operation on those numbers. Okay? So the header file is where you go to when you need to quickly assess what types of functionality has already been included. If you need to know the details, well, that's in a separate file, along with all of the other comments. Okay? So that's the key uh, organizational idea here, which is keep the header files clean for quick access, for quickly looking or quick indexing, and then put throw everything else in the .cpp file because that's where all of our comments goes. So and I can even make this one line too, like this. You know, same thing with the other ones. But again, it's this needing of comments here where we say, you know, performs. Uh, you know, LHS plus right hand side fraction arithmetic at param. LHS is the left hand side of the addition. At param, right hand side is the right hand side of the addition. At returns the value of LHS plus RHS. Okay? That's a lot of lines of code. It's not, I mean, it's just commenting, it's, but, it's, but it, it kind of dirties up the space. It makes quickly reading what's going on a little bit more difficult. Okay? So we, let's put this back. Let's make this. 
But if you are going to do this, you have to have the inline keyword. If you're going to inline it, otherwise it's going to tell you that you've either defined it twice, or you have a duplicate symbol, or something like that. So we'll put that like this. Okay. And now we're back here. Okay. Now, for example, let's say, now let me show you how I did this. So you can create manually a fraction.h file and a fraction.cpp file and just include them in your project, copy and paste the code over. Or if you're going to create a new class in Visual Studio, you can do the following. So I can right click, add. Well, I can add a new item and click, you know, header file or cpp, or I can add a new class. C++ class, okay, add. Class name, let's call it, uh, uh, well, let's call it points. So the reason I'm calling it points is because I'm going to eventually copy over my point 2D and color point 2D and points on a plane classes over there. But normally what you do is you create a class like polynomial and you name the header file polynomial.h. Okay, so before you wrote any of the polynomial code to start, you'd create a new class uh, called with with two two header files or a header file and a .cpp called you know polynomial.h polynomial.cpp. You can still do this for homework uh, uh, three that's due today. You can separate it into separate files. You don't have to, uh, but you can if you want. Okay, so now what what uh, what else do you notice here? You notice anything surprising in the back? Yeah, so you have options for inheritance. So you can specify a base class if you want. OK, let's not worry about that. Uh, let's see, what's it say? Access? I don't know all these options, but let's see. Access, default, protected, private, OK. Base class, you can inherit publicly, privately, protectedly. We're not going to inherit from any base class. What about over here? Yeah. Remember what I told you last time about destructors? What do you do with destructors? You always make them virtual. There's even a button here which visually reminds you, yeah, this is a good idea. Unless you're 100% certain this class will never be used as a base class and for use with polymorphism, you've got to make an explicit destructor, make it virtual. It doesn't have to do anything. The code itself may not do anything, but it has to exist. So if I create my class like this, now what is this other one? Inline. What does that do? Oh, it went away. What does it say? Let's read it generate both the definition and declaration of the class in the header file. Sound familiar? Okay. So when you declare and define together, that implies inline. Sometimes you don't need the inline keyword, sometimes you do. Okay. But when you declare and define together, you are suggesting that function be inline. So you can tell it to make everything inline, and then look what happened. What happened to points.cpp? It's not necessary. Why? Because if you're declaring and defining everything together, where do those all go? In the header file. We do not want to declare and define together everywhere. We don't want everything to be inline. So we're going to leave that unchecked. Now I click Finish. And see, it's added two files. It's created two files, a .h, a .cpp. What's in the .h file? Uh, ignore this pragma once for a sec. You have class points. It gave us a constructor and a virtual destructor. If we go to points.cpp, it gave us default definitions for the constructor and the destructor. Did that automatically for us. And it included points.h for us as well. Okay. Now, what did it do up here? What is this pragma once? Well, 
you can accidentally include a file multiple times. Okay? If you try and include a file multiple times, it will try and create two classes of the same name. And can you do that? No, it'll say it's already been defined. So what pragma once means is it tells the compiler, it tells the, um, the entire system that's trying to compile the files, once you've looked at this file once, don't look at it again. If, if the, there's an include that tells you to look at it again, just ignore it. It's already taken care of. Okay? So you need either pragma once or if you're on Mac and you try to do this, the equivalent, what you'll end up with is this if and def and define thingy. Okay. What is the difference? The difference is really subtle. Is there a preferred method? I have a preferred method, which I got from somebody who I think knows what they're doing. And they told me that this if and def is a little more preferable to the pragma once. You can feel free to use either. But I would prefer this if and def to the pound pragma once. Okay? Why? The details are very subtle. I don't know the full details. But I have it on good authority that this if and def way to do it is the way to do it. The only thing with this if and def is, is so if it, it's mnemonic for if not defined. You can call this whatever you want, say like that. Then what you're doing is you're defining okay, this set of code below. And then everything is exactly the same. And then at the end, you just have to put an end if, a pound end if. Okay? And all this does is it says, OK, only compile this set of code once. If you've defined a block of code called you know, frac, whatever I put in, in the middle there, shun, then if it's already defined, do nothing. But if it's not defined, then create basically the lookup tables and all the function calls. Okay. So you can call this whatever you want, but usually you just pick the name of the class, the name of the file, put it in all capitals, and instead of .h, you do underscore h. But you just, it doesn't matter what name you give it. Now, what's another thing that I'm sort of missing from these header files? The code will compile just fine, but what's one thing that you should always include in everything you write? Comments. Okay? So remember, in main, we have this at main page okay, stuff. But each file gets its own comments as well. Let's see, does it go before or after that end def? It doesn't matter, but let me just put it after. OK. At file. So this is a new keyword for your deoxygen. At file, uh, let's get it right, fraction.h at brief stores the fraction class. And then a larger description. OK, so this is the class definition for the fraction class that uses int over int, something like that. OK? So each file needs to have its own set of comments. I'm really bad here. I need to put like an at class fraction at brief stores int over int, implements numerical operators, and simplifies to reduced form. OK. OK, so this is important. Again, it's just a matter of bookkeeping, but it is a very important set of bookkeeping. So you go up here, fraction.h. Uh, this is fine. You do backslash star star at file fraction.cpp at brief, and then you know the implementation for fraction class with a description. OK? so. So let's see what I did. So let me change this pragma once to pound if and def. Let's call it points underscore h. Define points underscore h. And then I'm going to put a pound end if. 
And now what I'm going to do is, and this is what you can do with your homework files, is you can take all of the code above main that you want. So for example, here's my class point 2D, color point 2D, points on a plane. You could put these in the separate header files, but I don't want to go too, too nuts with this. Okay? Collection of points, various types. Okay, let's just put them all in the same class for right now, or the same file. That's my stuff before main. And let's uh, ignore those, those IntelliSense errors for just a moment. And then we're going to take all the code below main. These are the implementation files. And we're going to cut that out and put it in here. And I'm going to get rid of, I, I'm getting rid of this points class because there is no points class. Okay, put that in there. Now if we try to compile, there's going to be a ton of errors. So let's take a look at the first one. Um, not very sensical. But you'll notice the red underlines. What is it red underlining? C out, end L, also string. Ah, so what I need to do is let's, we want to do everything in points.h if we can first, and then the last thing we'll look at is the points.cpp, right? Because points.cpp calls number include on points.h. So I have to include the string library. Okay? So that gets rid of the string underlines. Oh, no, it doesn't. How come it doesn't get rid of the string underlines? Because I'm not using the standard namespace. Now, eventually, you're, you're going to just write std colon colon string and std colon colon vector. But for now, just throw it in there. Using namespace std. Now, what else is underlined was the um, C out and endl. So I number include iostream. It says p is undeclared. Ah, there is no points on a plane class anymore because I need to then, and now this is important. I'm only going to include the which file? The .h file. You don't, you sh it's rare that you will ever see a number include on a .cpp file. It's always on the .h file. Points.h, and it even auto-completes it for you. Okay, so it knows what you're looking for. Now if I go to compile, okay, so I still get a bunch of errors. It says points undeclared identifier. Um, okay, I wonder why that is. Let's take a look. What is points? Go to points. Okay. Ah, what is points? What's red underlined? Vector. Did I include vector? Nope, I should include it. Now it works just fine. And now it runs. Should run. Come on. Try this again. Compile. Build succeeded. Oh wait, I'm doing oh okay, never mind. I was doing control shift R, control R. It's F five. All right, so everything runs the way it does before. Now, here's something interesting. Okay, watch this. Uh, we don't need fraction right now, so we won't bother. But here's here's something interesting. If I take points and I put it up above here, uh, no, never mind. Let me not say that. Never mind. Okay, we're good. Uh, locally, each file, if you need access to a class, you just include it or you, you do the using namespace as usual. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Now if I want to use a fraction object, I can just go in main. I can, well, I've saved all this code from a previous post, so I can get rid of it all now. Okay. I can use a fraction object just as if it was a, an integer. So fraction a to, let's say, 8. And I can do a.print. And there it simplifies to 1 fourth. 
Okay? So this is really nice now. Look how clean my main is. I've just got a bunch of includes to different files, and I can create objects like a point 2D, p of 1, 2. I can call p.print. And again, it's just as if I was having them in my header file just as before. But now main is clean. Okay. Any questions on this? Why can't you use inline if you declare and define separately? You can use inline if you declare and define separately. It gave you an error? Yeah, it gave you a Let me rephrase that. You should be able to declare a function inline. Did you put it inline in the header file or in the CPP file? I'm guessing you tried both and everything. I think you need to put it in the .cp. Let's try it. Why, why think? Uh, let's do this. There's a time to think, and there's a time to just see what happens. Okay? Now is the time. For a question like that, it's the time to see what happens. So let's see. If I try to make this in line, I don't know. Worked fine with me. Let's see. Um, Let's try and just calling this. Sometimes if you don't call the function, it will uh, a plus b. Watch this. If I do a plus b, what type of object will it return? A fraction object, right? It still returns a fraction object. It doesn't have a name, but it still exists in memory somewhere, right? And I can call print on that object. So I'll calculate a plus b, and I will store a plus b, the value of that fraction object, somewhere in memory, but it doesn't actually have a name. But I can still call dot print on it because it's an object that does still exist in memory. Now we get our error, OK? So if I didn't try calling the function before, it wouldn't give me an error. That's a, a, an important lesson to learn as well, which is sometimes when you, um, if you don't call a function, you, you may not recognize an error until later on. You go to ship off the code. Somebody uses it and says, hey, I tried to call A plus B, and it doesn't work anymore. So let's see what happens. Let's try and put, uh, let's try all the different possibilities. Let's try doing inline there. Still unresolved. Let's try doing inline in one, not the other. Now it works. Okay. So yeah. So what what you're basically saying is, um, you know, create a link to a function with an input output structure as follows, and then in the CPP file you're telling the actual instructions to make. Um, I don't know why they've logically done it this way, but to make a function inline or to suggest to the compiler that a function be inline, you put it in the .cpp in the definition, not in the declaration. Yeah. There you go. So the, the, the comment is that maybe it's because when you write inline in the header file itself, that it expects it to be declared and defined right there. Whereas if you do the whole, or again, because it's a suggestion, um, it makes more sense to make the declaration first and then in the .cpp file indicate, well, when you're actually linking this stuff up, you might want to go back and double check to see if it's worthwhile. So yeah, but, but definitely the inline appears to be indicating that Ah, inline implies you must have a, a declaration here, and so it's an error to have a duplicate one in the .cpp. But I, I don't, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure the complete logic, but that seems reasonable. Yeah. So when you include string in the point star h file, for example, and then you include the point star h file in the main, does the include string usually still be there, or does it, is it already like taken care of because you didn't include star h? OK, so the question is about, I have a number include string in my points file and a number include string in main and maybe number include string in a bunch of other files as well. Do I need all these number include strings? The answer is if you do your in number include statements in the right order, you don't need all of them. But you don't want to count on that because maybe you'll include this, this .h file in another file somewhere else and you'll get it out of order. So locally, you should have all the include statements that you need within each file. 
And you don't have to worry about the, the functions being uh, included twice because because we took care of it using if and def or, or pragma once. Okay? So yeah, feel free to include as many times as you want in the, in the spirit of the order that you include things should not matter and trying to include a file multiple times uh, shouldn't matter either. Okay, does that, does that make more sense, hopefully? Okay, good. All right, now who wants, okay, question, yeah. No, it's fine, it's fine, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is one that we'll encounter later on in the quarter, which is, let's say you have a class and another class, and this class contains an object of this class, and this class contains an object of that class, or like a pointer. So they each need to know about each other. Um, yeah, that, that can be an issue. You, you make what's called a forward reference. Um, in that case, um, Uh, let me just leave it at that. A forward reference is the following idea. Let's say, for example, um, my point 2D is going to have a pointer to a points on a plane object. I can actually declare up here, oops, up here above, I can say class points on a plane. And then what I can do is I can say add in a, let's say a points on a plane pointer P, something like that. Right, so points on a plane contains a uh, vector of point 2D pointers. So that you say, okay, logically point 2D has to go before points on a plane. But then if I say, oh, well point, each, each point 2D object also contains a pointer to it, maybe a parent kind of, uh, class which is, for which it's a member of, so you, you need that one to go first, so there's a precedence issue. And you break the precedence issue by doing what's called a forward declaration of the class. You declare your intention to use a class by that name, but you define it later on exactly in the same way that a function is declared and then later defined. Very good question. With separate file compilation, I, let me hold off on answering that one for now. This is what's called a forward reference. This one here requires a forward reference. And just to, sh just to make sure that, that, yes, indeed, I do need this, if I comment this out, it does indeed give you what you expect, which is um, it has no idea what this is uh, referring to. This points on a plane has no idea. So. It gives you a couple of errors. It gives you a couple of nonsensical errors, but put in a forward declaration, and there we go. All right. Wait. Are there more questions? Good. Okay. File I.O. You know how you can see in and see out stuff to the console? It's a bit annoying sometimes, right? Like when you're doing your... Uh, testing your polynomial class, and you're like, 1, 2, 0, 0, 3, you know, minus 3, minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, enter, okay? Wouldn't it be nicer if you could just upload those values from a file or output those values to a file? Well, you can, right? And so this way, what you can do is you can say, okay, well, every time I want to test my polynomial or rational class, I just make one file with those coefficients, and rather than grabbing input from the console each time, it just grabs the input from the file, and I don't have to input it each time. And rather than outputting it to the console, which goes away when I press spacebar, and for some reason won't let me click and drag and copy and paste stuff inside the console, let me just write it to a file, and then I can copy and paste stuff and work with it. Okay, so the good news is, C in, C out are just one particular type of what's called a stream. 
And file input output work pretty much in the exact same manner. Okay? So all your intuition about C in and C out are going to uh, be very much relevant for the um, uh, for file input output. Okay? And we are going to do this resource acquisition is initialization, so this memory management structure in a way which makes working with file input output and operator overloading in a way that makes file input output as intuitive as console input output. Okay? That's the goal, is to basically say, you know, rather than doing C out something, you'll just maybe F out it, and you'll create an F out object which is initialized with some file you want to write to. Okay? So remember number include IO stream? Of course you do. It's included in every program. Okay, so IO stream is what we've been using, but let me break it down for what we're actually doing here. The second bullet point says basically a stream is just a sequence of data that you can add to or take out. Think of it like a sequence of characters. And you can put characters in, you can take characters out, and you may want to interpret those characters as a numerical value, as digits in a number, or what, however. Okay? So the console stream is the way to get characters into this set of characters and take them out in a way that you're now very familiar with. Directly from the keyboard. Okay? But really, you think of a stream as just a large array of values. When you use CN, it's kind of counterintuitive. When you use CN, you're actually putting stuff into the stream. And when you do C out, you're taking stuff out of the stream. So CN and C out are not really about you know, like inputting text and outputting text. It's about sort of putting stuff into a stream and taking stuff out of a stream at its core. And then it, it can print out those characters to the console. Okay? So they're very similar in principle to string variables. They merely store a collection of characters in a very specific order. And it's about the stream objects like C in and C out know how to interpret those sets of, of characters. Um, this one's actually wrong uh, down here. This idea is actually not how it works. Okay, But it's, cl it's pretty close. I'll fix it right now. So at this point, we all know very well what the following line of code does. C out, hi there, and L. But now that we know what operators are, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Okay? This is actually, C out is actually an object. Guess what the name of the operator it's calling is? Less than, less than. Okay? So you know how you have operator less than? Well, operator less than, less than is a separate operator. It's overloaded by the whatever object the C out is, whatever data type the C out object is. It's overloaded to accept, and this is where I got this one. Um, it was an easy mistake to make, but it is a mistake. I need to correct it right now. Um, this is actually an operator. So when we call this, this, write this line of code here, it actually gets converted to a non member operator less than less than with an input parameter of C out and hi there. Okay, so it's a non-member operator, and then right. So there's parentheses from here to here, and then it's going to call it again. So this is actually a non-member function. This operator non-member function should return. It actually returns a reference to whatever data type C out is. It is similar to. It is, not, it is kind of a mix between plus equals and plus. And we'll see why in a minute. Similar to, not really. Okay, let's get rid of that. But okay, so now that we know about operators, and there's member and non-member, this is actually calling a non-member operator. Um, and in fact, here I'll show you how the magic happens. Watch this. So let me get the following. Copy paste. What happens is, is this is going to call a function and it's going to return C out, basically. Make that black. Okay. Now it's going to do it again. So it's going to look at this, and now it's going to. This line is actually equivalent to operator. C out. 
comma, and L. I'll put this in parentheses. Okay. And now what does this function return? This function returns the exact same thing as it did previously, which is just a reference to the Cout object. So it's just like you're replacing it with Cout. So this is, so let's go through that again. So this is how it works, right? So you do C out high there. The first thing it does is it goes from left to right, and it says this is calling operator less than less than with input parameters C out for the left-hand side and high there for the right-hand side. It returns C out, right? So it, after it runs its code, it returns a reference to the C out object so that it can then invoke the same function again, only with parameters C out and endl. Does anyone know what endl is? Take a guess. What do you think endl is? I just told you C out was, was an object. It's, it's actually an object. What do you think endl is? An object? <laughs> I'm glad you said that, because the answer is no, it's not. <laughs> Good. I know, I set you up to be like, it's, of course it's an object. You said it like that. Uh, any other one? Any other guesses? Some sort of constant. It's actually a function, yeah. NL is actually a function. Well, it's a function pointer. Did you guys learn about function pointers? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I didn't cover it when I taught PIC 10A the last time I did it. But basically, um, so unless someone tells you these things, you honestly don't know. But you don't need to know as long as you can use them. Okay? So, this is essentially what happens when you call a statement like C out, and this returning of a C out reference is why you can do the chaining. Just like doing plus 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 A, you're returning a reference to the object so it can keep calling the operator over and over again. So the same thing is true with C in and C out. Okay, so wait. Da, da, da. Okay. Um, here's how the inheritance structure works, okay? So at the very base of the class hierarchy is the I stream and O stream classes. If you just want to store a collection of characters meant for um, pushing characters into this collection or taking them out of the collection, you've got the basic I stream and O stream functionality. Now, the IO stream adds to that a specific set of functionality optimized for what type of input output uh, um, scenario? Console. Okay? There are certain things you can do with streams relating to consoles that are a little bit more specialized than just a sequence of characters. Now, there's an IF stream and an OF stream. Those are more specialized functionality for, take a guess. Files. Yeah, files, exactly. Okay? So again, you have the basic idea of a sequence of characters, and then there are certain functions that you would only write for a file stream or a console stream that you wouldn't necessarily want all of your streams to have access to. Now, what about this O string stream and I string stream? Those are my least favorite streams, but they're basically for converting strings as in like characters of digits into numerical values that are like integer values. So if you're going to like write a matrix to a file or read a matrix from a file, you actually, the matrix is stored as a character of digits and spaces and or commas. And you have to take each collection of numbers and then convert it to a numerical value. So that's where the I string stream comes in. You can get an entire line of a file and then extract each numerical value as if you were typing it in as CNs each time. Okay? But this is the idea. The idea is that you've got um, basically the ability to work with streams specialized to the console, to a file, or if it's a string, like a set of standard characters that you then want to maybe convert to numerical values. So here's code from your book that I modified slightly. And I'm going to completely, 
I'm not going to spoil the fun. Let's go through this first. Okay? I'm going to do something to this. Number include IO stream. Okay? Number include F stream. Okay? So now the F stream library unlocks both the OF stream objects and the IF stream objects. Okay? These are data types. And what we're going to do first is we are going to, after we include the appropriate library, we open a data stream with the name of a file. Okay. For this class, we're only going to work with text files. .txt, it's the simplest type of, of file. Okay. So what do we do? We create an if stream object called input data. Then we call .open on it, and we give it the name of a text file. Now the path is usually a local path or a global path, depending on how your Xcode or, or Visual Studio is set up. Okay. So it creates a file somewhere. But the first thing we have to do is ah, it, it attempts to open a file okay, that already exists. But what if the file doesn't exist? So this is going to be the data that we're going to input into our program from a file somewhere. Maybe it's a set of coefficients for a polynomial. Okay? Well, if the file doesn't exist, we can't do anything. So we need to test first and foremost for whether or not we tried to open a bad file. Okay? Maybe we got the name wrong. Maybe the file got deleted. But we have to, this is actually more important than you might think. Okay? You always, always, always have to test to make sure the file was found. If it doesn't, we need to either print to the console or cause a, a runtime error. We're not going to do runtime errors in 10b. That's more of a 10c thing. But you have to check for whether or not the stream object is in the fail state. Have you seen the fail function before? Where have you seen the fail function before? cn.fail, right? If, you, if it, the cn was expecting a numerical value and you typed in the letter a, the CN stream goes into the what state? The fail state. Okay? It's the exact same thing for files. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. There are certain shared functionality which is there because of the uh, hierarchy or the, um, the input output structure. Okay? So we do that. Then we want to um, get data from the file using, say, an int value. Well, if you replace input data with CN, this is exactly the type of code you would write, which is, OK, while you're grabbing numerical values, say for coefficients, from the console, you keep inputting them in one at a time. And all this code is doing is saying, well, instead of grabbing the numbers one at a time from the console, just grab them from the file as if you were typing them in from the console. Okay? So everything is exactly the same. Then it, that prints it out. That's nothing new. The only last thing that's new, and then I'll let you go, is Input data dot close. You've never needed to do this before, but this is kind of like a new and a delete. You've opened the file, you've called dot open, and now at some point you need to tell the processor that you're done accessing or putting a hold on this resource. Okay? While a file is opened, another program may not be able to access the contents. Calling dot close frees it up so that maybe some other process that wants to access it can do it. Okay? It's kind of like, you know how in Microsoft Word, if you try to, um, what is it? If you try to like, uh, overwrite a file that's open in another program, and it says, like, cannot modify the file because it's open in another program, it's because it's placing a reserve on it. It's saying, no, 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 no. I'm working with this file. You can't mess with it because if you do, that's going to mess up my program. It's the same idea. Calling.close basically says, OK, I'm done with it. Do whatever you want. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll go over next time how to take this idea and convert it to one that uses the resource acquisition is initialization, or RAII memory structure, and how operator overloading can be used so that we can literally think of file input output in exactly the same way and work with it exactly like console input output.